Thank you. Am I audible? Uh, good morning, everyone. Sorry, I didn't hear. Uh, I think I was not clear. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, now it's, I think it's audible. Okay. You know, when I got to know that I will be speaking in this art house and inside the chamber, I spent good two weeks not preparing what will I talk here. Talking about open banking, I can do even in sleep. But thinking, how should I walk? Should I walk how a country leader would have walked in this room while he was addressing his parliament? Chest out, shoulders up, chin up. Or because it is a banking day, should I walk like a banker? How a banker who is tired, in fatigue, in meeting his customer expectation, and day in and day out, what I walked. And then I decided to walk, to walk like an aspirant banker. A banker who is exceeding his customer expectations every day. A banker who is progressive and alert. A banker who is progressing towards future of limitless banking, open banking. So before I begin the session, I have a question for you all. So how would you rate yourself in terms of your understanding of open banking? On a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 means you are consider yourself as an expert, expert in open banking, and 1, when you are new to open banking, but you are keen to learn more. Or 5, when you know a little, but want to know more. So how would you rate yourself? Can I see hands? 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 10. Oh, I see a lot of people are giving themselves like below 5. Right? So, so today you are going to learn about essential elements of open banking framework, which you can carry with you when you go back after this presentation to your organization. And in next 20 minutes, you will learn about at least four new things about open banking. And I promise you at least four new things which will help you rate yourself better the next time somebody asks you about your understanding of open banking. So if any of you are rating yourself zero right now, or less than five, you will rate yourself at least seven. That's my promise. So before I start with introducing essential elements of open banking framework, let me start with sharing three misconceptions, three things which many banks and even insuring company thinks are wrong about open banking. The first is with the word open. So many banks and even insuring company thinks that by being open, it means giving unrestricted access of their customer and bank data to an external partner which may be compromised. The fact is, no bank we know about, as IDC we have or spoken to, have shared any customer critical data or bank critical data with external partners, which can be compromised or may lead to a financial losses. And even if they have shared any customer information, it is on customer request or with their consent. The second misconception, which has made many banks not to start their journey towards open banking, is they think it's never too late. So these banks are willing to wait, watch, and start later after learning from the success and failure of their competition bank or peer organizations. The fact is, in 2017, 35% of banks progressed with open banking. And this number is expected to rise to 60% in, in the, by the end of 2019, and will further rise to 80% by the end of 2020. So that means by the end of next year, eight out of every 10 banks will have progressed in some way with open banking. And if that is not alarming enough for banks to progress with open banking, let me present you with one more fact. That is, seven out of 10 
banks which have progressed with open banking, they are using it to improve their operational efficiencies and increase their customer reach. So that means while some of the banks are waiting and watching, their competition is taking away their balances, customers, and premium. And now the third misconception, which even the banks which have progressed with open banking or started their journey, they have. That is, no bank have been able to get benefited from open banking yet. And let me tell you, there are not one, but many examples of how banks have got benefited in many different ways. So like I earlier mentioned, they are using it to improve their operational efficiencies, service efficiencies, and meeting the needs of unserved and underserved customers. So if any of these three reasons were reason behind you not progressing fast enough or not starting your journey towards open banking or even open insurance, I think it's time for us to think again. So what exactly open banking brings into us? So open banking brings in three changes. First, it makes banks open to collaborate. Collaborate with external partners, with fintechs. So banks are realizing that these fintechs, these external partners, can bring in far better efficiency, innovative technology, and can add value to their customer life cycle at far lesser cost, effort, and time. And as banks are open to collaborate, banks that will lead to the second change, that is banks will realize that they can no more be a sole custodian of their data, of their customer data. So banks are opening up themselves for the data platforms of external partners on which customer is interacting. And that is leading to the third change. So banks are realizing that more and more customers are doing more and more financial transactions, banking activities outside banking ecosystem. So banks need to open up themselves to other industries. And for instance, a customer making a purchase on an e-commerce website expects a bank to convert that purchase into an option to pay in EMIs or installments at the time of checkout, at the time of making a payment. So what is customer expecting here? So customer is expecting a bank to act as a trusted node between a customer and an e-commerce player or third party while processing payment. So all these three changes, that is banks are being open to collaborate, open for data platforms of external partners, and open to other industries, is what making banks to move towards open banking. So now, if I have to summarize what open banking, how we define open banking is, open banking is a way, is a technological enablement by which bank shares a controlled access of customer, product, and, and service-related information with external partners to improve or reassemble their product and services using open APIs. Now, I would like to take a pause here, and before I move to the next section, I have one more question for you all. So, and it is for the banks present here. So how many banks present here who have progressed with open banking, have built a robust framework around open banking, covering all the essential elements of API development and management in their organization? Can I see hands? I knew you. Anybody else? So in the crowd, I see only one hand. And in fact, as per even IDC research, only two out of every 10 banks which have progressed with open banking have built a robust framework around open banking, covering all the essential elements of API development and management. So let me introduce to you six elements of open banking framework which you can refer to when you go out from the session next time while you're building a framework in your organization. And let me take you through each of these elements and let's see how banks across Asia Pacific are progressing on them. First is, of course, 
it's no brainer banks needs to start with building apis and like we yesterday discussed around that api as a product your apis are just like your any other banking product which requires regular updation and upgradation based on changing end user requirement and here your end user may be your end customer who is using it or an external partner with whom you are sharing your apis so banks need to start with building simple useful and reusable apis so banks may start their journey while taking initial steps of developing apis which are simple customizable in demand further banks need to build api interface to manage and seamlessly integrate these apis with external partners further they need to update and innovate and upgrade the existing set of apis based on changing and user requirements changing expectations and introduce new apis based on how the new needs emerge in the market and while doing all this they need to constantly work on improving their deployment or around time of deploying these apis to an external partner and as banks build apis they will use it to partner with the external world that is the second element to share data product and services and i'm sure that will arise questions in many minds whom should you partner with and how so an ideal approach which most of the banks who are successful with open banking have followed is to start with partnering intelligently so banks need to very clearly define why do they want to partner how do they want to partner and with whom do they want to partner so when it comes to how possibly banks can partner with the external world there are broadly two ways which we have seen first as a service provider so which can be a good approach in case banks are not fully confident of their partners capabilities and want to mitigate the risk of reputation loss in case this partnership doesn't go well or another uh, reason why they can partner with as a service provider is when a product or a service is demand so such as sharing payment api with an online retail store on which customer is transacting interacting the next option which we banks have as in how they can partner is as a co-branded partner which can be a good approach in case uh, the the partner is a bigger brand well known or upcoming brand and by doing this they can make use of marketing spends of the co-branded partner and can also this partnership can also help them in increasing their customer reach and <coughs> increasing sorry uh, increasing the customer reach and adding value to their own brand and now the next question which arises is how should you partner right like i spoke to many bankers and they always ask me how do we decide whom to uh, partner with how to start a journey towards open banking so the golden rule which uh, even the most successful financial institutions which have progressed with open banking followed is to start with your friends and family first so i'm not talking about starting with your in-laws and laws but i'm talking about starting with your close business associates or customers who are innovation or in technology space so the idea here is to start with people you can trust when you are starting a journey start with people you can trust and if we see how banks across asia pacific have progressed or progressing around sure becoming partner and providing banking as a service 5 out of every 10 tier 1 and tier 2 bank are expected to share at least 5 external retail banking based apis in 2019 interestingly 2019 will also be the year when banks will expand their horizon and come out with wider corporate banking based plan offering access to transaction banking processes and as per idc estimate one out of every 10 bank which is in tier 1 and tier 
will offer at least three external corporate banking based APIs by the end of 2020. And I know as a bankers, we all are lazy and somebody will, must be thinking what all these are APIs are, these five free. So to make your work easy, we have released list of 30 common retail and 20 corporate banking based APIs which you can refer to while creating your own list. Now I know you must be having another question. Okay, these are the list of 30 and 20. How should I prioritize? Which one to pick? So to lessen your efforts further, we at IDC can help you build your own API prioritization matrix, something like this, which can help you categorize your APIs based on the associated risk, investment required, vis-a-vis -vis value or benefits you can drive out of these APIs. And using this matrix, you can set your priorities right based on your strengths and capabilities. Now that takes us to the next element. So as banks build APIs and partner with the external world, a need will arise for them to connect, to connect their internal and external processes of retail and corporate core banking system where each of the smaller unit of business functionality will be moved out of the monolithic core discreetly, transforming it over time to drive actions out of data and insights. And the technologies which will be used in this kind of a co-transformation will be, again, open APIs, microservices, and agile development. And, the re and you will see the resurgence to build this connected core will see a rise among all top banks worldwide. And as per IDC estimate, 10% of banks will allocate 5% of their IT budget in next two years to connect their retail and corporate core banking system to offer what? To offer or improve their credit decisioning for their customer, uh, corporate customers and to enhance their customer experience for both retail as well as corporate segment. Now, this kind of a co-transformation will give rise to a major challenge of ownership. That is, who should be held responsible for the success and failure of such large transformation project, isn't it? Don't we ask, debate internally, if the cost, who will share the cost? It's a business or IT. So an ideal approach to address this concern is to set up a cross-functional management team. A team which not only understands difficulty which an IT team might face while building such large transformation projects, but also understands the need of a business team for whom it is being built. So, a bank need a team which comprises of people from four verticals. What are those? First, IT. Of course, you need IT who have a technical know-how of building such large transformation projects. Next, you need a representation from product or a business team. Because a team which have a good understanding of banking product and services and can help IT team in understanding the same. Next, you need a representation for marketing. Anybody surprised with that? So marketing can help you in three ways. First, a marketing can help you understand the changing customer expectations, requirements, and update product and IT team about the same. Second way it can help is in designing communication plan, writing marketing plan in which how these transformation are going to impact the end customer and communicating it to them in the right way. Third way it can help is understanding the impact which an external partnership might have on your own brand. The next representation you need is from analytics. Our analytical team can help you understand data, crunch data, identify trends, and monitor profitability. And once you set up this team, you should make them responsible for their own success and failure, for their cost and their profit. And that leads to the next element. 
As banks share data and share it with external partners, a need will arise for them to secure. To secure not only banks' internal data, but also secure customer data and their privacy. And as per IDC surveys around open banking and digital transformation, we observe that eight out of every 10 banks which have progressed with open banking and are in advanced stage, even they have concern around securing customer data, their privacy, and protecting themselves against cyber threats. Hence, it becomes more so important for banks to build IT solutions that not only protects them from anomalies, but also prepares them for the challenges that comes along with open banking. And this problem will become more so large as the number of APIs grows with time. Right? If, uh, today you might have 10 APIs to manage, tomorrow you will have 100. How will you manage these? So banks are realizing that building IT solutions or platforms which can manage, monitor, and control these APIs, and at the same time can secure the data can be a tedious task requiring huge investment. So banks can actually optimize their efforts by subscribing to an API management platform, which is offered by many ID giants, and many players are even present here in this venue. Right? So a good API management platform helps you get a centralized view of all your data. It enables you to manage, monitor, and control flow of data in APIs to an external partner. Further, it helps you to secure your data from anomalies which are present today or which might arise in future. Next, it helps you to reuse, scale up, and upgrade existing set of APIs based on changing customer expectations and introduce new APIs based on new needs emerge in the market. And while it does lot many other things, it comes at far lesser cost. Lesser cost as compared to the investment which you will have to make in case you want to build such IT platform in-house. Now, if you look at how banks are expected to adopt or progress towards uh, subscribing to API management platform, 35% of banks will subscribe to such platforms in 2019. Now that takes us to the next element. Although external, it's critical for banks to govern their APIs to align with existing regulatory policies. Till the time they hear from regulators with the firm guidelines around open banking, addressing governance and compliance issues. The irony here is, in the absence of firm guidelines around open banking, the journey towards open banking for even the most ambitious financial institution present here will be uncertain. And if you look at how regulators across Asia Pacific are progressing towards issuing guidelines on open banking, we are already aware that Singapore, Australia have already released their initial draft for reference to banks. Hong Kong has already released working on a draft for, and they are consulting on that to be soon followed by countries like India, South Korea, New Zealand, where we are expecting the initial draft to come in the next 12 to 18 months, to be soon followed by countries like Thailand, Malaysia, and in the next leg, we'll see countries with huge potential, such as Japan and China, to come out with their initial draft in the next 24 months. Our regulators from other, other nations have been observed to be focusing on other priority areas at present, while coming out with small guidelines around sharing of data for banks. Hence, the next 24 months are very exciting uh, months in terms of how banks will progress with open banking across Asia Pacific. This is the most exciting two years. And that takes us to the last and the most important element of entire open banking framework, that is what, why we are here to know about open banking. That is to monetize. To monetize from data and APIs. 
So when we uh, spoke to many banks which are progressing with open banking or planning and asked them how important is it for them to monetize from data. So based on survey, eight out of 10 banks consider data monetization as one of the most important and critical factor for the success of all their open banking projects in their organization. However, the irony is six out of 10 lacks the ability to monetize. So we at IDC got curious and wanted to know more how some of the banks are doing it. So we spoke to many bankers and looked at several examples of how banks are making use of internal and external data to drive value out of data and APIs. And based on these examples, we devised these seven models of data monetization based on how banks are generating direct and indirect revenue streams in association, in collaboration with external partners. And two very common models which we have seen bank adopting really fast, a bank as a producer of data and bank as a producer of product. Now, to sum up, we looked at six elements of open banking framework. Let's recall what are those. First, is a first for banks to start with building open APIs. Simple, useful, and reusable. To share data, product, and services. To build a sustainable partnership with the external world using common in-demand APIs. Further, banks need to connect their internal and external processes to build a connected core. And to do this, they need a digital team, a team which comprises of people from four verticals. What are those? IT, product, marketing, analytics. And further, banks need to build IT solutions to secure, to secure their data and APIs. And one of the possible solutions to do this is subscribing to API management platform. Further, banks need to govern their APIs to align with existing regulatory policies till the time they hear from regulators with the firm guidelines around open banking. And meanwhile, they have to strengthen their API governance internally to be ready for the future of banking tomorrow. And last and the most important is for banks to devise a strategy to monetize from data and APIs to create a path to monetization. Now, I would like to end here with the hope and expectations that you will use these six elements when you go back to your organization to build a robust framework around open banking and when next time somebody asks you about your understanding of open banking, you will be able to rate yourself better. Thank you for your patient listening. Thank you, Anoush. Thank you very much. What a start of the day. Any questions from the audience? Yes. I'm not surprised. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anuj. Um, a question I have for you is, in your research, in your studies, um, one of the things that I'm worried about with open banking is there is no actual, and I think someone was asking about this yesterday, standard, right? So uh, each country, each bank might choose to define their APIs a certain way. Um, are you worried about the proliferation of a variety of different types of interfaces, APIs, et cetera, coming out that then makes the consumer, right, the uh, SMBs, whatever it might be, uh, makes their lives harder, thereby kind of defeating part of the purpose of creating this open banking initiative and ecosystem. Okay, uh, so uh, the thing is in, in Asia Pacific, we are not exactly following what uh, we have seen with PSD2 where regulators have come with a stringent guidelines which banks need to follow. In Asia Pacific, each country is working on their specific needs. And the needs, it, the needs are defined by the end user. It's not defined what bank thinks and what banks are learning from uh, other nations. Yes, they are learning. But what they are giving up utmost priority is what their customer need. For example, in India, 
uh, because I'm from India, so I would use India as the first example, you will see a lot of transformation are happening around uh, with Aadhaar coming in, national identity coming in, around payments, digital payments, uh, real-time payments, right? Whereas if you see in other countries like, say, for example, Thailand or Malaysia, you will see a lot of innovation is happening around improving efficiencies within banks. They're focusing more on that, right? Similarly, in, uh, say, Singapore. Singapore is the first country to release, like, a number of APIs. But how many banks are actually using all those APIs, right? So every country, like Australia, Australia is again working on a different paradigm, right? They have different priorities on which they are working on. So yes, Asia Pacific is the most exciting even for the world, and that is the reason where everybody, whenever I go and meet anybody uh, in IT company or anywhere, the first question they ask is, okay, if you are if you are from a US, okay, tell me what is happening in India, what is happening in Singapore, how come you are progressing so fast? Because we are adopting to open banking in a very different way. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, you, you gave us a very interesting definition of open banking, and you talk about the reassemble, uh, reassemblement of products via open APIs. Can you elaborate on what you mean by reassemble products? Okay, uh, well, what I mean by reassembling product, that in, in, uh, in past days, bankers or banks used to provide with a standard products to an end, end user. There were not too many variants, right? If you want to open a savings account or a current account, you were giving like five product, you can choose one. Now banks are building capabilities where they can customize it based on the end user requirement. So they are giving him option, okay, we have this list of 20 features, you can pick any 15 or 10 which are of your utmost priority. So that way they are rebundling, they are reassembling their product, not going by the standard one definition of if you are of this income group, you'll get only this. Even irrespective of what you bring into the bank, bank is still providing you a customized solution for based on your needs. Uh, and I, I can give you more examples, maybe I can if, if, if meet you later. I can tell you how banks across Asia Pacific are actually making changes in the product. Um, so you mentioned that data monetization is also a possibility. Could you give any example of a bank which is okay. actually doing data monetization with a live use case? Yes. Okay, so I give an example of Maybank. So Maybank just recently did a tap with the Western Union to provide a seamless uh, cross-border transfer uh, on their app. So instead of building this capability themselves, Maybank could have done that, could have invested. They thought of partnering with Western Union, which has presence in 200 more countries, right? So it's easy for them. So what is happening here? So a customer going on Maybank app, doing, uh, want to uh, buy a foreign currency or want to transfer money, they, he place a request there. Ultimately, it is being processed by Western Union. But for a Maybank, it's a added capabilities which they are bringing at far lesser cost, right? And, and a wider scale. So it has improved their operational efficiency and always also increased their customer reach. So now customer is not going out with the same service. Yes. So, yeah, so data monetization may not be direct always. It may be in form of acquiring customer or keeping customer with you, right? Right now the banks are facing a challenge where on an average every customer have at least two accounts. So the fight is for who keeps the balance, maximum balance, maximum wallet share. So the fight is there. As long as you are able to retain that, you are monetizing on that. Any other questions? I think yes. behind you. Oh, here first. Can the same framework be applied to other industry aside from banking? Yes, the concepts and principle like I have mentioned are similar for even open banking, open insurance, or anything you talk about. These five principles which I shared remain same. These have are not two different. Any telcos before? Sorry, I. Have you consulted any telcos before in regarding to um, this area? 
Uh, no, so I lead banking practice, so I mainly speak to uh, banks, but yes, uh, uh, I can give you an example from India. In India, Atel has come out with Payment Bank. So basically, it's a telecom, com uh, telecom company, but now moving into a financial space. So of course, uh, 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 telecom companies have the richest data, right? Better than a bank. Because generally, there are not more than like three, four players in a country who are in telecom space, who are leading, right? So banks can actually uh, are looking, will look forward to tie up with these telecom players and how can they place their product in an app which is managed by telecom players. So there are ways where uh, even telecoms can monetize from this. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more question. I've got one actually. You said that uh, eight out of ten uh, companies, uh, banks are, are um, uh, their priority is secure, secure data, security. Uh, what are the other two uh, uh, worried about? Okay, so they are not worried about because either they have already uh, put things in place which ensure that they are secure, right, or they are already working on the projects, right. So they are, uh, like I mentioned, they are progressing, but they are progressing thoughtfully. So they have, either they have not shared the data with, uh, with the partners who they think can risk their data. Uh, mainly it is like a large, uh, large uh, organizations which have multiple wings, right? So they are partnering within the group. So that is also happening. So they are not sharing data any outside the larger organization. So they, are, they still know that, okay, my, my peer organization or will not actually compromise with security of my data, right? And, or, or they are prepared, they are already prepared with the, they are implementing uh, solutions which keeps them safe. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for Anush. <laughs>